song we just sang, you know, we didn't see Jesus, we didn't see all these things, but we believe. And uh, as we study Jesus' teachings, Jesus' direct teachings, the words of Jesus himself, it's exciting that even though we weren't there, we have the word of God where we can look and see the words of Jesus and learn exactly what he wants us to know. And that's going to be uh, what we'll continue with this morning in our lessons on Luke, uh, this series on Luke. We're in Luke chapter 11. I think it was uh, maybe three weeks ago, the way that everything worked with the meeting and, and schedules, um, where I did the, the previous lesson on this, and it was a Sunday evening. So if, if you missed that, I encourage you to go back. If there's a recording available on Facebook and YouTube and Spotify and maybe somewhere else, I don't know. Um, but we, we talked about the Lord's example prayer where he, the, the disciples asked him to pray. And we talked a lot about that. And then really, this is a continuation of that. So uh, I think the part of it here, verses 5 through four, five through 13 of Luke chapter 11, is this question, does God hear our prayers? I think that's, that, that question isn't exactly asked, but I think that's implicit in what we'll study. And so this is just a continuation of Jesus teaching his disciples to pray. So as we think about a bit of an outline of what will be covered here, um, do, do neighbors help us when we ask them for help? It's one of the examples or illustrations that, that we'll look at. And then the direction to, to ask for things, seek for things, knock for things. And in the context, again, of prayer, we're asking God, we're seeking God, and we're knocking on the door of, of God and asking for these things as we pray. And then another illustration, you know, do dads help their kids? Do fathers help their sons? And so then these illustrations relate uh, one way or another to, to God the Father. And we'll think about that in context of prayer. But maybe a quick review of, of the Lord's model prayer. We'll read through that since these really do link together. Let's just read through uh, verses 1 through 4 of here in chapter 11 to get that in our minds. It says there in verse 1, And it happened that while Jesus was praying in a certain place, after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John also taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves also forgive everyone who is indebted to us, and lead us not into temptation. And we looked at Matthew's account and some other uh, verses that go with this as well, but this is a short version of, of what we're thinking about. But thinking about the, the summary of what that prayer in, in, in encompasses, what it includes, you know, there's an address to God, God as our Father, this idea that we're praying for God's will to be done, and we're praying for our daily needs. We recognize our dependence on God and those physical things, but also spiritual things. We're praying for deliverance from sin. We need help from God, and we're praying to him for those things. So that's the super quick version of the previous lesson. Uh, moving on to the next verses then, where Jesus has done giving this example prayer, but now he's continuing to talk about the same subject in the next verse. Verse 5. Look verses 5 through 13. Then he said to them, Which of you has a friend, and will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot rise up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not arise and give him anything because he is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. So I say to you, ask and it will be given to you. 
Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. He, he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. But what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish? Or if his son asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So we'll, again, we'll explore these, these questions. And maybe we're already thinking about that. It's not that long of a passage. You know, what about the neighbors and how they help? That idea of asking and seeking and knocking. And then this illustration of fathers helping their children as well. So that first one is the illustration of neighbors. So do neighbors help? Just a practical thing. If you're going to ask your neighbor for help, do they help you? So back to what we read. He said to them, which of you has a friend and will go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing set to set before him. So so you have to imagine yourself in your house and you have surprise house guests. Oh, my friend came <laughs> and maybe I wasn't expecting that. Um, and we want to be hospitable. And I think probably all of us would want to help our friend. But so much more in that culture, this hospitality was just a huge deal and a huge shame if you aren't being hospitable uh, to your guests. And so all the more amplified even the, the feelings that we would have on that. We would want to pr provide for our guests. It's very important. We're going to get up in the middle of the night and take care of this. But this guest comes and we're not prepared. We don't have the bread. We need to be able to provide them some bread. Oops, we're not ready. So uh, perhaps as a husband, our wife might say, go to the neighbors and, and ask them to borrow some food. As she makes preparations, we, we have a lot to figure out, you know. Oh, no, I don't want to do that. I don't want to go over there. It would be my, be my thought. Uh, I don't want to go bother them. Uh, wake them up. It's the middle of the night. But it's so important to be hospitable. I'm going to eat my uh, pride on that and go. And I'm going to ask for, for help with that. I'm going to ask for three loaves. Now, probably not thinking about a big bag of Roman meal, three of those, or Wonder Bread, you know. We're, we're so blessed in, in our country. Everything's big. You know, I don't know how many slices of bread are in a big loaf we tend to get today. These are probably more modest loaves. Maybe three servings would be the idea to think about. Maybe uh, three slices of bread or six slices of bread and you two slices to make a sandwich or something. But less than what maybe we would think about from a loaf. But, but what does our neighbor think of this? We're coming over there uh, to wake them up. You know, verse 7. And from... Inside, he answers and says, Do not bother me. The door has already been shut, and my children and I are in bed. I cannot rise up and give you anything. You know? So you're asking them to get up and give you bread. But they're like, I'm sleeping. We're all sleeping. We're in bed. We, we can't get up and do this. This is a you problem. You and your bread. We, we're, we're, we're sleeping. And we have a complicated door that's... We set for the night, and it's a big deal, and we're not going to get up and do that and open the door. You know, what in the world? Why are you coming here bothering me? It's not really surprising that maybe he wouldn't want to help at that time of night and everything. It's not really his problem. Basically, you know, go away. But that's not the whole story. The needy neighbor who wants this bread because of the situation where the, the house guest showed up, he doesn't give up. I have this house guest. I, I know you're sleeping, but I need three loaves of bread. Just keeps asking. Well, as it goes on, I tell you, even though he will not arise and give him anything because he's his friend, it's not just like he's so excited to help his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. You know, you just keep bugging this neighbor, basically. Uh, so that he finally gives, gives up on this trying to just stay asleep. 
he helps you. He can't sleep anyway. At this point, you keep knocking on the door and yelling or whatever. Because of your persistence, this neighbor will help you. You've worn him out. Okay, okay, okay. I'll give you the bread. Just be quiet. But of course, this isn't about neighbors uh, and bread. It's it's this idea of prayer, right? We're thinking about Lord the Lord's model prayer we talked about. So the question is, will will God hear us? Will God respond to us? Will he listen? Will he help us? Does God get annoyed with us like this neighbor with our prayers? Oh, you're constantly praying. Is that God's perspective? Does God get worn out? He's sleeping. He can't deal with us at this time, maybe later. Well, I don't think that's the, the idea for God. In this neighbor scenario, you know, when we when we pray to God and, and, and we uh, ask him for things, we're like that neighbor who forgot the bread, but but God is not like the grumpy, sleepy neighbor that doesn't want to get out of bed. That's not God. So this is really an illustration of contrast. So even though, um, you know, the first neighbor that needs bread kind of represents us praying, and there's a sense in which the next door neighbor who has the bread is sort of representative of God, it's, it's showing that God is not like this. It's a contrast. And there's another parable in Luke that makes the same point. If we jump ahead to chapter 18, Luke chapter 18, verses 1 through 8 there, we can read another situation, a parable. Now, he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray. It's the same subject, right? It's important to pray and not to lose heart. Keep praying. Be diligent in prayer. Verse 2, saying, in a certain city, there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. Now, there was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him saying, give me justice from my opponent. So we don't know the backstory in that, but there's some problem, some controversy, and she needs help from this judge to help make it right. She's asking him. And, and for a while, he was unwilling. But afterward, he said to himself, and this is where, you know, this is clearly a fiction. Jesus is, is making this story up to illustrate this. This judge says, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, that's probably a real person wouldn't actually say all that, but that's the idea. Even though I, as a judge, do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow is bothering me, I will give her justice, lest by continually coming and coming and coming, she wears me out. And the Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said. Now, will God not bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? So we see this contrast with that unjust judge and God who we petition. I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find that faith on the earth? Kind of an open-ended question there. So the idea here is that just like how we have that neighbor who was unwilling to wake up and help, and this judge who is initially unwilling to go out of his way and help this widow. But both of them eventually actually do what they ought to do. They do respond due to the persistence of the petitioner. And so there is that lesson to get, you know, we should be persistent in our prayers. But, but God, of course, has a different attitude than these reluctant helpers. God's going to bring about just justice swiftly. He's going to answer our prayers. Now, swiftly in God's mind and perspective versus ours as humans, you know, be in his time. A day is as a thousand years and all of that sort of thing. You know, it may not feel swift to us, but God is on our side with these things. He's not uh, reluctant and, uh, oh, you're bothering me and all this kind of stuff. He loves us, but he has a plan and he's going to take care of things in his time.
So the neighbor and the judge, they're unwilling to help, but God is willing. We can look at a psalm like uh, Psalm 34, the Old Testament, Psalm 34, verse 15, where it says there, the eyes of Yahweh or the eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous. He's looking toward his people and his ears are open or toward their cry for help. He's, he's attentive to us. His ears are tuned into us. God loves his people. He's not like that sleepy or grumpy neighbor or the judge. And God does not sleep. Psalm 121 verse 4. Behold, he who keeps Israel, a reference to God, he who keeps Israel will not slumber and will not sleep. God does not sleep. But even the unwilling neighbor will help because of your persistence, right? So how much more our Heavenly Father, who actually loves us and wants the best for us, he will help us. But we should be, be patient and persistent in our prayers, too. Recognizing that principle of the persistence in prayer is, is something that, that can prove to be successful. As we continue here in our text, this next section, we're ask and seek and knock, verses 9 through 10. Verse 9, so I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives, and he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. So we're, we're to ask God for help. That's the idea here, right? Context of this is prayer. We're to ask God for help. We're to, to seek out his help, to seek him out. Maybe there's even an idea of, you know, Bible study. We should, these are not separate activities, right? We should be immersed in God's word and, and be praying to him and helping each other and all of these things that are, are part of what we should do as Christians. We're to, to be seeking out his will or to be knocking on his door. And again, maybe that involves Bible study. You know, what, what do you want me to do in, in this situation that I have a difficult question or I'm having this struggle? Sort of knocking on, on, on God's door, asking him for help, seeking out him and his help and knocking on his door. And if we ask, we will receive blessings. If we seek him out, we'll find him. And if we knock on that door, in his time, those things will be opened according to his will. Because God is generous. Unlike the sleepy, grumpy neighbor and the judge and all that, God is generous. God loves us. God is there for us. What about another comparison here to help us understand how God will take care of us? The idea of, or the illustration of earthly fathers. You know, do dads help their kids? I think we could all just think of that as a straight question. Well, yes, that's dads tend to help their kids. Dads love their kids better than the neighbor, right? You know, hopefully our neighbor loves us or doesn't hate us or whatever, but they're not part of the family like, like dad. Dad is family. So verse 11, but what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead of a fish. Or if his son asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then being evil, you know, relatively speaking to God, not that uh, dads, because they're a dad, they're evil or whatever, but, but we're comparing people to God, right? If you then being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So dads, you know, if your, if your son wants something nice, like a fish, a goldfish, and I don't know in this context, if he's asking for food, I need some fish to eat. Um, but then it's contrasted with a, a snake. It almost seems like, you know, something nice and gentle versus something dangerous. You know, we're not going to give something dangerous to our son. You know, if you're asking for an egg, something harmless, something helpful, maybe to eat. You're not going to instead give them a, a scorpion that's going to sting him, hurt him. 
You know, now the dads don't do that. Normal dads don't do that. Maybe a psychopath dad that's like a murderer or something. But dads love their sons. That's just common sense. We understand that. We give, want to give good gifts to our children. And there's a different uh, aspect of that in, in Matthew's account. As we studied, Matthew's and Luke's have some parallel accounts here. He says in verse 9 of, of Matthew 7, Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, a loaf of bread, will give him a stone? So, you know, if you're going to ask for bread, hey, Dad, can I have some bread? Here you go, buddy. Here's this rock, you know. That's not what that's not what dads do. Um, dads love their sons. Parents love their kids. We want to help them thrive. You know, of course, that's true. But dads are just people. They're imperfect. We're flawed and sinful as any people. But if dads can be expected to give good things to their sons, as this common sense tells us, this illustration that Jesus is sharing. How much more the God of heaven, our creator, giver of life, the one who sent his son to die for us, is he likely to give us good gifts? I think so. Now, that, the passage there toward the end um, talks about um, either giving the Holy Spirit here in Luke or in Matthew's account, he'll give good things. Let's see, if we go back there. Um, that's pretty far back. <laughs> um, anyway, the idea is that God is going to bless us with good things, all the things that we need. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit in Luke or good things to those who ask him? That's the point. And we can look at a passage in James where it talks about the Father and his gifts. James chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good thing given and every perfect gift is from above, from the heavenly realms, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no Variation or shifting shadow. All the good things we are blessed with, you know, where do they ultimately come from? God the Father. Everything good comes from Him. You know, we might think, oh, well, I have a job and I made money or, you know, whatever thing, whatever way we might think about that, all of the blessings ultimately come from God. And He does not change. There's no variation or shifting shadow. It's not like, Sometimes God decides to randomly be mean or something. And then sometimes he's nice. One day he decides, oh, I'm going to give my son to die on the cross for the sins of the world. And then another day he's just mean and doesn't, he changes his mind about that or something. He is true and faithful and steady. There is no variation or shifting shadow. He loves Everybody. He wants everyone to come to repentance. And he loves his people. So how much does God love his people? Even all mankind. And we can look at that famous passage from John 3, 16 and 17, which is so often quoted. And this is from the New English translation, the Net Bible. It says, For this is the way God loved the world. He gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He's not just capricious and hateful. That's not what this was about. But that the world should be saved through him. God gave his son. He was thinking about the sins of the world. To, to, he sent his son to wash those away and give an opportunity for, for people to have eternal life if they're faithful through faith. And that's how he loves everyone. He gives us this opportunity to be faithful. And he, he wants us to be faithful to him, and he will be faithful to us as well. And that's the whole point of prayer, right? That 
we can ask him for things and we know he's faithful to, to take care of us. And we know that when we pray uh, prayers of confession, he's faithful and just to forgive us, right? As John writes. So, does God hear our prayers? Well, hopefully we understand the answer is yes. And not only does he you know, aware of them or whatever, but he is loving us and wanting to respond. We looked at this illustration of, of neighbors and, and do, you know, do they help? Well, sometimes they're just helping because we're bugging them so much. They maybe don't really want to help, just want us to go away and be quiet. Uh, but that's in contrast to God. You know, God invites us to ask for things and gives us this promise that we'll receive them. He, he invites us to seek him out and gives us the expectation that we'll find these things that we need. He asks us to knock on the door to invite him in and, and, and seek him out, those things, and that door will be open and we'll be able to find out more about God and, and to find the things we need. And of course, the, the things we need aren't always the things we want, right? Sometimes we have a different idea about what all we want. You know, God is not a genie in a bottle to do our every, every whim and every request, but we can pray to him for those things we need according to his will. We know that those who ask receive, those who seek find, and those who knock will have the door open to them. And then that last illustration, the second one, where the idea about dads and how they love their kids, obviously, of course, but they aren't God. And how much more will our perfect, holy God, our Heavenly Father, how much more will he help his children? I always like to give us a parting passage to leave, to leave up here. Verses 9 and 10. So I say to you, ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks, receives. And he who seeks, finds. And to him who knocks, it will be open. And so as we think of an invitation, it's a call to action, right? What about our prayer life? Are you praying like you should? Am I praying like I should? Are we praying in faith? Are we praying faithfully? You know, do we, do we realize how much better our Heavenly Father is than, than the neighbor in the illustration or, or the judge from Luke 18? Or even our, our mom or dad, how they, they would, of course, want to love and help us. How much more does our Heavenly Father love us? So Jesus is challenging us by, the disciples asked, teach us to pray. And so Jesus kind of gives this example and these challenges, you know. He's teaching us to pray. Are we going to apply his teaching in our prayer life? Let's be challenged to increase our prayer life and to grow in that. And of course, if anyone needs to obey the gospel, we always want to extend that invitation. We need to be uh, buried with him in baptism and repent and rise to walk in newness of life and, and be, become part of a church family. We want you to be part of the family. But if anyone uh, perhaps is a member and needs to repent of some things and uh, maybe they want to do that publicly and ask for prayers or even just uh, some things you're struggling with and you would prefer to to come and ask for prayers. Obviously, you can do that anytime. You don't have to necessarily come forward. We can talk about that privately, or you can put something in the suggestion box, all the different ways. We want to be a church family and help each other. So we're going to sing the song that Caleb selected. Is thy heart right with God? Is your heart right with God? That's the question. Let's think about that as we... Uh, Sing this song and stand together.